Welcome to Tomorrow's World. In 1859, Charles Darwin published a book that shook the world. On the Origin of Species has been referred to as one of the most important books ever written. And indeed, it is. It is truly a book that has changed the world. More than a century later, Michael Denton published a book about Darwin's work titled Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. In it, he rightly states the following. Any suggestion that there might be something seriously wrong with a Darwinian view of nature is bound to excite public attention. For if biologists cannot substantiate the fundamental claims of Darwinism, upon which rests so much of the fabric of 20th century thought, then clearly the intellectual and philosophical implications are immense. Immense indeed. It is difficult to quantify how much of our thinking has been influenced by the evolutionary explanation for life. But as Denton says, the idea has come to touch every aspect of modern thought, and no other theory in recent times has done more to mold the way we view ourselves and our relationship to the world around us. The triumph of evolution meant the end of the traditional belief and the world as a purposeful created order. What is the legacy of a worldview which rejects the understanding that we are part of a purposefully created order? Are we better off believing in John Lennon's world without religion? Or do we see a world adrift, going in every direction leading away from peace and harmony? On today's program, I'm going to discuss what your biology teacher may not have taught you and what the implications are for Darwin's theory and your world. Stay tuned. A warm welcome once again from Tomorrow's World to all our viewers around the world. On today's program, I'm going to show you some things your biology teacher may not have shown you about evolution. We're going to see the implications of a theory that rejects meaning to life and how it contributes to the disharmony we have in today's world. We'll also look at what it means if Darwin was wrong. Even when Darwin published his thesis, there were problems with a lack of fossil evidence. And the passage of time has only served to dramatize the problem. The truth is that the fossil record tells us there hasn't been a slow evolutionary process occurring on Earth. We could spend a whole program, yea, a whole series of programs on Darwin's problem with the evidence written in stone. But today his theory has even greater problems. Michael Denton's 1985 Evolution, A Theory in Crisis did what no other book had done. Like a skilled surgeon with a scalpel, he systematically and carefully shredded Darwin's thesis. Point by point, Denton challenged the empirical evidence for evolution with such skill, knowledge, and intellect that he lit a fire among educated class of scientists and scholars who had courage to speak out on what they could now see. Darwinian evolution is a failed theory. One such individual was Michael Behe, a tenured professor in microbiology at Lehigh University. In the video, Unlocking the Mysteries of Life, Behe answers the question why he, as a former believer in evolution, changed his mind. He explained that he always assumed evolution to be true and never questioned it until he read Denton's book in 1987. It was then that he explained that Denton revealed very difficult problems for Darwinian evolution, which I had never thought about and which no one in all my studies leading to my PhD had bothered to mention. I immediately recognized that they were difficult problems 
and I became angry that no one brought these up. I felt like I was being led down the garden path to a conclusion that didn't really have the evidential support that I thought it had. Three years later, Michael Behe published Darwin's Black Box, in which he challenged the empirical evidence based on his knowledge of microbiology, and he coined the now famous expression, irreducible complexity. The example B he uses to explain irreducible complexity is that of the common mousetrap. The trap has five essential parts, a base to hold it all together, a bar to slam down on the mouse and kill it, a rod to hold the bar down until it is tripped, a spring to give the bar the power to bring about the demise of the mouse, and a bait holder to attract the mouse to the trap. Behe's point by using this example is that if you remove any one of the five parts of the trap, it's a worthless piece of junk. It cannot kill a mouse. In the same way, a cell is made up of many different parts and contains machines made up of many parts that are so precisely engineered that if any one part is missing, it will not work. The classic example of such a machine is the flagellum bacterium. Most biologists portray life in a hierarchical pattern from simple to complex. It is generally believed and taught that life evolved when various chemicals rubbed together in some primordial pool of water and somehow adhered to one another in such a way that by mere chance they developed into some kind of self-replicating molecule. Over many thousands of years it gradually evolved into a simple cell, which then evolved into more complex cells. Of course, no one has ever produced such a cell by this method in a laboratory where the most exacting conditions can be applied. Nevertheless, high school and university professors, books and documentaries promote this totally unproven theory as though it's a fact, but is it? On the surface, this may sound plausible to one who is ignorant of the facts. Is it really possible for such an event to occur? And is there anything really simple about life? The late Anthony Flew didn't think so. Flew may not be a name you are personally familiar with, but he is well known among serious atheists. Quoting an ABC News report, at age 81, after decades of insisting belief is a mistake, Anthony Flew has concluded that some sort of intelligence or first cause must have created the universe. A superior intelligence is the only good explanation for the origin of life and the complexity of nature. What caused such a turnaround in thinking? Quoting Flew, my whole life has been guided by the principle of Plato's Socrates. Follow the evidence wherever it leads. Let's look at some of that evidence. If there were a simple life form, it would be bacteria. But as Flew discovered and Behe and others now point out, there is nothing simple about any known cell. One example of that is E. coli bacteria. Known as a flagellum bacteria, it is so small that four billion can fit in a tablespoon of liquid. And each one has a set of outboard motors that work in concert with one another. Each motor has 40 separate parts, made from about 25 different proteins, and it is a finely tuned marvel of engineering that causes the flagellum, that is the propeller, to spin, moving the cell through its liquid environment. Consider this. Professor Kaichi Namba was so fascinated by this tiny cell with its remarkable motor that he has devoted his professional life to studying it. In the Japan Nanonet Bulletin, he explains it rotates at around 20,000 RPMs. He goes on to describe the mechanism of this highly efficient flagellar motor that is far beyond the capabilities of artificial motors. Further, it can stop in one quarter of a turn and immediately reverse direction at the same speed. 
Now this may sound simple, but the ability to shift directions is something NAMBA has been studying extensively in an attempt to unravel the mystery of how it is done. The bulletin goes on to highlight the fact that it is obviously designed to rotate. Scientists who study these marvels of design and engineering use mechanical terms such as bushings, rotor, stator, universal joint, drive shaft, and propeller to describe its various parts. Note this comment from the January 2000 edition of Physics Today concerning this simple bacteria. In addition to rotary engines and propellers, E. coli's standard accessories include particle counters, rate meters, and gearboxes. This microorganism is a nanotechnologist's dream. As this quote from Physics Today demonstrates, there is nothing simple or primitive about this lowly bacterial cell. After spending numerous pages describing this technological marvel, Michael Behe makes this astute observation. When we see an outboard motor, we see the way the parts interact and so on. We know someone made that. Namba, Behe, and Flu are not the only ones fascinated by such complex cellular structures. As it turns out, every cell is a marvelous miniature manufacturing plant of such complexity as to leave us aghast. Denton comments, Molecular biology has shown that even the simplest of all living systems on Earth today, bacterial cells, are exceedingly complex objects. Although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, each is, in effect, a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. How could such a complexity happen by chance? Michael Behe's thesis is that various cellular machines are irreducibly complex. Every part is needed to make it work. If one part evolved, it would be worthless without the other parts evolving at or near the same time. And as is the case of the flagellum, 40 parts are necessary. Remove any one of them and it won't work. And with any complex machine, it has to be assembled in a particular order. How does the cell know how, in what order, to assemble the machine? If I were to hand you 40 parts of a complex motor, would you be able to assemble it correctly? Perhaps. But here is a brainless bacteria that somehow knows how to first of all manufacture the parts to the precise specifications and then assemble them to produce a motor that can turn at 20,000 RPMs, stop in a quarter turn and reverse at the same speed in the opposite direction. And that is only one part of the flagellar cell. What scientists now know is that there is no such thing as a simple or primitive cell. All cells are incredibly complex. Denton quotes Jacques Monod as follows. Thus the simplest cells available to us for study have nothing primitive about them. No vestiges of truly primitive structures are discernible. Books, documentaries, and science teachers discuss the origin of life as though it were a simple process of various chemicals attaching themselves together in a pool of water on the early Earth's surface, what they call a chemical soup. But the problem and debate over life coming from a non-living chemical soup is huge and one that evolutionists are losing. Every new discovery demonstrates just how complex life truly is, and the greater our knowledge, the greater the gap between non-living and living. But the problem is not with the soup alone. Denton explains, 
the most difficult aspect of the origin of life problem lies not in the origin of the soup, but in the stages leading from the soup to the cell. Between the basic building blocks, amino acids, sugars, and other simple organic compounds used in the construction of the cell, and the simplest known types of living systems, there is an immense discontinuity. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. The law of biogenesis is attributed to Louis Pasteur, who observed that living things come only from other living things. Evolutionists would like to say that there is one exception and that somehow through blind chance a non-living chemical soup produced life. However, Denton observes that if this did occur, it would prove the very thing evolutionists are attempting to disprove. The complexity of the simplest known type of cell is so great that it is impossible to accept that such an object could have been thrown together suddenly by some kind of freakish, vastly improbable event. Such an occurrence would be indistinguishable from a miracle. The implications of these new discoveries are huge. If, as more and more scientists and informed people are now concluding that Darwinian evolution is seriously flawed, what does it mean for our world? In Thomas Woodward's Doubts About Darwin, he explains how the intelligent design movement is changing minds and where it is leading. Essentially, respected professors at prestigious secular universities are rising up and arguing that, one, Darwinism is woefully lacking factual support and is rather based on philosophical assumptions, and two, empirical evidence, especially in molecular biology, now points compellingly to some sort of creative intelligence behind life. But to admit intelligence as the cause of life literally terrifies many hardened evolutionists. As Michael Behe explains, the discoveries of the last 30 to 40 years should be a cause for great celebration. But such is not the case. Why? Behe explains, why does the scientific community not greedily embrace its startling discovery? Why is the observation of design handled with intellectual gloves? The dilemma is that while one side of the elephant is labeled intelligent design, the other side might be labeled God. The bias against God is strong among many, but there are consequences for his rejection. To the greatest extent, the unquestioning wholesale acceptance of Darwin's theory of evolution has brought us to where we are today. Quoting once again from Denton, The triumph of evolution meant the end of the traditional belief in the world as a purposeful created order. The acceptance of this great claim and the consequent elimination of God from nature was to play a decisive role in the secularization of Western society. In the debate over life's origin, there are only two known alternatives, and secularism comes down on the side of evolution. But between God and a purposeless existence, there is no neutral ground. One view says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, while the other teaches there is a purpose for life and there are obligations concerning how we relate to the one who gave us life and to those around us. Most of the Western world is now steeped in secularism, and to some degree it's spreading elsewhere. While many profess belief in God, God is not real to them, as they live a secular life far different from that instructed by the Christian Bible. Sadly, people see secularism as non-judgmental and neutral, but it is anything but non-judgmental and neutral. 
For the last 150 years, we have seen a more secular Western world. It is difficult to quantify how much of our thinking has been influenced by the evolutionary explanation for life. But as Denton rightly explains, if biologists cannot substantiate the fundamental claims of Darwinism, upon which rests so much of the fabric of 20th century thought, then clearly the intellectual and philosophical implications are immense. It is truly difficult to believe just how misguided leaders can be when they have no moral compass to guide them. Consider a new California state law passed in 2013 regarding transgender children in public schools. Quoting from a Telegraph article, Pupils in California schools who identify as transgender will be free to choose which laboratories they use and whether they want to play on sports teams for boys or girls under a new state law. All 6.2 million state school pupils aged between 5 and 18 are to have the right to, quote, participate in sex-segregated programs, activities, and facilities, end of quote, based on their self-perception rather than birth gender. Karen England warned that it would result in first-grade boys going to the restroom next to first-grade girls without any supervision. Just because a boy wakes up one day and says he believes he's a girl, they shouldn't be allowed access to the girls' locker room. The Bible has a great deal to say about nations and individuals who reject God. Psalm 14 verse 1 tells us that it is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. But the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of the book of Romans addresses our subject better than any other biblical passage. It minces no words, but tells it as it is. It explains the rejection of God and why there is no celebration over the discovery of the mysteries of life that have been unraveled in recent decades by the scientific community. And it explains why the wrath of God will come on a rebellious world. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. He also addresses the arrogance we see among the so-called educated of the world when they refuse to acknowledge the obvious. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. What are the consequences of living in a world where mankind rejects a purposeful and meaningful existence for a world of blind chance? Make no mistake, there are consequences. Through the Apostle Paul, the Creator of life makes known those consequences, and they are exactly what we see in our world today. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Darwin's legacy is evident. 
The consequences of living only for today without a greater purpose can be clearly seen in today's world. We call our program Tomorrow's World because we look forward to the time when the God of creation will step in and bring harmony to this troubled planet. If you'd like to see more proofs that there really is a Creator God, go to our website which will be shown momentarily. There you will find a booklet that you can read online or download titled, The Real God, Proofs and Promises. This booklet gives easy to understand principles that have profound significance. Some of the chapters are, Creation demands a creator. Life demands a life giver. Laws demand a lawgiver. And design demands a designer. This booklet will help you face the most important question of all, is there a real God? Other literature on our website will answer the questions, is He interested in me? And what does He want of me? You don't have to live a meaningless, purposeless, and empty life. We have literature on our website that can help you understand the very meaning of life straight from the pages of the Bible. So be sure to come back each week at this same time and station to learn more about the Creator of life, the meaning of life, and the good news of tomorrow's world. I'll see you then. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. The preceding program has been produced by the Living Church of God.